Okay, great. I just opened everything up so that people can come on. Okay, great. So welcome everyone. I'm Theodora Scarato with Environmental Health Trust, and I'm here with Victor Leach, who is a radiation health physicist and atmospheric scientist, and he's been working for 40 years in the field. He's the founding member of the Oceana Radio Frequency Scientific Advisory Association, and he formerly worked at the Australian Radiation Laboratory, which is now ORPANSA, of the Government of Australia. And he's going to be presenting on the research that uh, ORSA has analyzed and compiled and talk about what is happening in Australia at this time. So thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, okay, thank you, uh, Theodora. Um, yeah, uh, as Theodora said there, um, I've actually worked um, over 45 years in radiation protection. And uh, you've got to remember that um, most of our, most of my colleagues, and um, I'm a founding member also of the Australian Radiation Protection Society uh, back in 1975. You've got to remember that most of um, our, um, our colleague, most of my colleagues work with X-rays and gamma rays. There are very, very few jobs in the area of non-ionising radiation. And um, except for uh, some lasers at universities, um, laser safety, um, most of my colleagues don't aren't really, uh, not really had a look at this um, wireless communication um, area and um, and of course a, a very sort of ignorant of it um, so given that background you've got to understand that um, when I go to uh, the last five years I've been going to the Australian radiation protection conferences and delivering papers on this subject um, saying look um, I think we've got a problem here um, these, these are uh, modulated waves and uh, they're actually interact inter interacting with biology and actually causing uh, biological effects. And these effects are not trivial. And um, after I've given these talks, um, my colleagues come up to me and say, gee, Vic, well, I didn't really, um, I didn't really uh, look at this subject area, but now, you've, uh, now you're talking about it. I think we do have a problem. So I've been trying to wake up my colleagues over the last few years that we do have a problem in this area. And it was um, when I was working at Queensland University of Technology uh, and uh, near, my, near my end of my career, I uh, was the radiation protection advisor there. And uh, we, I had uh, a lady uh, come to me as uh, in my office and say, well, look, I, Look, I've just had, um, and she was a young lady, she, she said, I've just had a, uh, a tumour removed from my um, breast. And um, do you think, um, do you think that, uh, that mobile phone I was putting in that area, do you think uh, this could be a result of uh, me putting my mobile phone in my bra? And I said, look, I, I don't really know. And this is about a decade ago. And uh, I said, well, I, I don't really know, but, but I'll, I'll look into it. And what I did then was, like most of my colleagues uh, in Australia, I rang what I thought was an expert uh, in the area. So I rang um, Dr. Ken Joyner, who I, who I knew from the Australian Radiation Laboratories uh, years ago. And he said to me, look, there's not a problem. I'll send you a fact sheet. You know, women get breast cancer for all sorts of reasons. I, I don't think this, you know, I think you're uh, reading too much into this. And so anyway, I got this sort of glib email with, uh, um, with this uh, fact sheet. And uh, I looked at it and I thought, no, it's, this isn't right. I'll, I'll, I'll look a bit harder into this. So um, I, I got Dr. West's paper and I started reading and started to realise that the, uh, what Dr. West had pointed out was, in fact, the, the tumours were actually quite unusual. They weren't nodular, they were more in a line. And then I thought to myself, well, that, that makes sense because um, you've got antennas in there and they would tend to um, align. So I thought, oh, that, this is interesting. I'll, I'll look into this. So at the same time, I had a lady in the li li library area 
uh, call me up and she said, oh, you're the radiation protection advisor. Would you like to uh, come up here? I'd like to talk to you. And I said, yeah, fine. So I went up to see her and she said, look, I'm terrified. She said, I've just had a tumour removed from the back of my ear. And uh, she said, I'm convinced that tumour was a result of my heavy use of mobile phones. And I said, well, hang on, wait a minute, you're a librarian. Why would there be heavy use of mobile phones here? And uh, she said, um, well, I've, yeah, I've come back to work in the, the library. That's my, um, my original training. But in fact, I've been working for my husband's real estate business. And I've been using a mobile phone up to my ear for many, many hours a day. And, and I just, these workmen are going up onto the roof of this building and they're, they're um, telecommunications workers and they're rolling out this technology on the top of that, this building. And I'm terrified about that because as, as, you know, as she said, she, she just had this tumour removed from the back of her ear. And it was a vague, it was a vagus nerve tumour. It wasn't an acoustic neoma. So I said, "Oh yeah, okay." Um, so I said, um, well, "What do you, what would you? I'll, I'll get some instruments and do some measurements." So I rang a company um, and I said, "Look, would you come here and do some measurements? For I don't have the equipment. Would you like to do some measurements?" And it was very very expensive. Uh, so uh, she. I went to my, my um, supervisor and I said, look, we, we've got to buy some equipment and do some measurements. So I bought a spectrum analyzer, an erroneous spectrum analyzer, and started accumulating the spectrum in her office. Before that, though, I said to her, look, I don't think there's much of a problem here because you're actually under, you're on the top floor of the, the library and you're actually under the, under the tower. So um, the panels are pointing outwards. So I don't think I'll really be able to measure very much here because you're underneath it, you're in a shadow. And she said, um, well, I'm still worried about it. So I got the equipment and started measuring and I got, I got a real surprise. I actually was getting quite large power density numbers. And, and, I, and because it was a frequency spectral analyzer, I could actually look in the actual frequency windows so I said, this is strange. I'm actually getting quite large numbers here. And I looked out the window and on the next building, there were towers pointing in her direction. So, yeah. So I thought, well, this is interesting. So the next thing I did was I left it running there. And then I noticed that throughout the day, the levels changed quite dramatically. And in fact, at lunchtime, uh, when the, all the kids came out from uh, their lectures, they all switched on their mobile phones, and and the place the the, um, uh, the spectrum analyzer lit up, lit up like a Christmas tree. So I was I was really quite shocked by this. Even though the levels were low, the variation throughout the day was quite dramatic. And then I looked, started looking at the standards, and I thought, oh, six minute averages. What are you going to measure in six minutes? You know, you need to be measuring over a day. So where are the background measurements? Where are the, where are the, uh, where's the data that shows us this is changing over time? So then I, um, I, I contacted uh, some of these companies who produce what they call the environmental, uh, environmental reports for these towers. They do a, they do a report and, uh, and I had a look at it and I rang them up and I said, look, um, uh, how do you generate these reports? And they said, oh, we just calculate the numbers. Uh, we just assume that the panels are uh, operating at 100% and we just calculate the numbers. And I said, you don't do any measurements? And they said, no, no, we don't do any measurements. And I said, this is nonsense. This, how do we know how the background is changing? So anyway, that, that's how, that's, that stimulated my interest. And then I started to uh, talk to other colleagues and, uh, and I contacted, I knew some friends who were doctors and uh, I contacted them and had a chat with them. And then I realised that this ICNIRP standard was basically nonsense. This is a nonsense standard. It's, it's, um, it, it's, it's based on heating. And then I realised that, that we, had, we had a problem with, this, this, uh, with these standards that were being rolled out. So, um, about five years ago, as I said, uh, the experience I had at Queensland University, uh, at um, Queensland University of Technology, I then, I actually, in the last 
couple of years of my uh, before retirement, I actually in, uh, was uh, involved in uh, getting the health approvals for a cyclotron at the University of Queensland. Uh, and while I was at the University of Queensland, I actually met another another la a lady who uh, was a psychologist who uh, said she was electro hypersensitive. And then I met a few other people. And then I started thinking, well, hey, we've got to really look at this science. So about five years ago, we, we established the Oceana Radio Frequency Association. And uh, we, we got together a group of uh, scientists. We got together um, biologists and biochemists. We got together and started talking about how we would structure this society. And what it was important to do was to stay focused on the science. So um, we, we noticed there was great gaps in the, um, in the information uh, that was being put out there. So we decided to, to uh, at, at the first point, we decided to review the science, but we realized in order to do that, we needed a whole lot of people with a whole lot of different disciplines. Now, as I said, we knew a few doctors and uh, we, I contacted uh, friends who, who were doctors and I said, look, would you like to um, assist us? I had an occupational uh, safety guy. Um, I had a, a, another, another chap who was uh, a, fr a great friend, known him since uh, 1978 when we worked in the uranium mines together. Uh, I, uh, he's, he's a professor at a local university here. I, in um, occupational health and I said look would you like to join us so we assembled a team of people who had a diverse backgrounds some of the doctors were actually um, scared to join our association they said oh look uh, we, you know we don't want to put ourselves up in lights up there you know we've got um, uh, we've got to worry about um, how people would perceive this, you know, uh, uh, the, the official line is there's not a problem, you know, so there was a, a great reluctance to actually join up with us, but in fact, they, they help us in the background and, and uh, when we get stuck on a biological question, we go to them. So we've the number of, uh, so there's quite a, a range of people that we've got uh, in ORSA and uh, working for us. So we're a not-for-profit organisation. We, we don't take any money from industry. We really, we, we, we just want to look at the science. And we, when we got together, we started looking at the data, what data was actually available. And uh, we looked at EMF portal and uh, we also looked at uh, uh, PubMed. And we decided when you look in those databases, they don't actually categorize the information. They just discuss it um, and uh, just uh, basically do an evaluation of it, but they don't actually categorize whether in fact this was an effect or no effect study. They don't categorize the outcomes. They don't categorize the endpoints. There's, there's sort of no, it's very sort of uh, uh, general and generic. So um, we, we decided the other thing too, is that these databases all cont contained lots of papers uh, on uh, medical evidence, uh, like for example, ablation which really wasn't really relevant to what we wanted to look at. And so an electrocution, you know, uh, uh, EMF portals got uh, lots of papers on electrocution, uh, totally irrelevant to what we wanted to look at. We wanted to look at uh, those uh, experiments which were, were uh, below the uh, ICNERP guidelines, which showed bioeffects, and we wanted to categorise the endpoints of the experiment and the outcomes of the experiment. So the, hence we set up, um, and you can see a pie chart here, it's not really easy to see, but we, we categorized all the papers into epidemiology, which are doing disease studies. We categorized them into cell studies in vitro. We categorized them into in vivo. And, uh, and we've got these other studies over here, provocation studies where they put people in a room and they, they turn on the antenna. The interesting thing about those studies, and they're, they're a bit of, uh, bit, bit of nonsense really, but the interesting thing about those studies is that um, it, over 70% of the studies which used um, uh, EEG machines and ECG machines, they, they actually show um, changes in brainwave patterns 
which are uh, over 70 percent of those studies show that which is quite interesting but the trouble is with these studies is that um uh, biological systems aren't linear i mean you you can you can go out in the sun today and um tomorrow um if, if if tomorrow you you'll hey i've got sun i've got i've got sunburn i got i got uh, i've got a problem so this is what happens with a lot of these people who actually get exposed the the effect doesn't happen straight away it's it's some hours later or a day later that they they suffer with headaches and they don't feel well and uh and then there's a, a slow a uh, slow uh, recovery process. So uh, the, these um, these experiments where they turn they they put people in a room and switch on uh, the antenna and say, "Do you feel it?" I mean, they're they really are a bit of bit of nonsense. And the other thing we noticed was there was um, a little wedge here which says uh, possible beneficial effects, um, which is two percent of all the studies, very small. But um, some of the uh, researchers say, look, um, maybe there's some uh, therapy. There's also this, there's a group, this group of papers down here, which we call uh, non-experimental scientific studies, which are basically either measurement studies or dosimetry or reviews. And the big problem with reviews is you can select what papers you want to give the outcome you want in a review. And uh, you've, you, when you look at these review papers, you've really got to look at um, the uh, who's funding the review, and uh, where where the where the money's coming from, and um, what the scientists uh, are previously um, um, in terms of their um, research, what their what their belief systems are, and um, so reviews are very tricky, and um, you've got to be careful of them. But with the in vivo and in vitro studies, these are pure ex experimental studies in the peer review literature. You've really, the, um, most, it's very difficult to mask the, the effects, but biology is really interesting. And um, Steve Weller, uh, one of our uh, biochemists has been evaluating uh, the, um, how you can actually uh, perform the experiment to actually give the outcome you want. And, and that can be done as well. So as I said, there's over 3,800 papers and um, we've made the, uh, the um, databases available freely on the web. You can go on there, log on it. The, I suggest that you don't do that straight away. You go and look at the training videos. And in fact, um, I, I was um, thinking that possibly um, I should do a training session on that because a lot of people now are using this database around the world in selecting papers. They're looking for particular types of papers and selecting them and asking questions. Um, and some of those questions are really questions of, um, uh, of how to use the database. Um, so it's, um, it's, a, it's, um, it's just a learning curve. Like anything that's uh, research orientated, there's a learning curve associated with it. So, um, yes, yeah, so, um, we, um, we just recently in Australia, we had a parliamentary inquiry and um, which um, uh, the parliamentary inquiry, the, uh, the health wasn't really on the agenda, but over 85% over of the papers were about health and uh, the parliamentary inquiry, you can see there, there were 24 witness groups who had 45 minutes each. These were all um, for the technology, and um, we 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 had uh, we had 15 minutes to talk, a very short term time, and there were only six groups there. Um, so they didn't really want to talk about health. They said, "Oh, that it's all it's all um, it's not a problem. It, it's um, you know the economic standard covers that." Um, a panza here in Australia who who are the uh, pseudo-regulator, they, um, and I say they're pseudo-regulator because they're not the real regulator, they're a bit like the FCC in, in, um, in, in America. Um, the, uh, the real regulator is the Australian Communications Media Authority, and they select the standard they want. So here we have a situation in Australia, and I think the same in America, is where the, um, we've got the, the uh, fox in charge of the chickens. 
So, um, and so they select the standard that they want and, um, and uh, they've selected the APANZA standard, which is the, which is the ICNURB standard. And there's a reason why a PANZA has selected that standard because um, they're a Commonwealth authority and they, they are um, uh, in charge of uh, Commonwealth safety. And um, you've got to remember within the Commonwealth, um, that's the federal government, there are, there are some uh, fairly risky things they do in, uh, in health laboratories and that. So they need a standard that, that allow them to do the maximum amount of research or uh, uh, not to be impeded. So they, this um, a PANSA standard is the ICNIP standard, which um, the FCC in, is basically the IEEE standard. They're, they're all sort of related. They're all basically talk, um, uh, ignoring all the bio effects uh, in the non-thermal area, and um, they um, they keep saying that oh, there's no health there's no health effects associated with these bio effects, which I I completely disagree with. You know, I'd like to add that the our Panza website up until 2020 recommended that reduce that parents reduce exposure to their children. It stated that on the fact sheets. Uh, and now that's been removed as of this year, that information has disappeared from the Arpanza website. And I'll put in the chat the before and after. So something's changing over there as well. So I'm looking forward to hearing what the outcome of the inquiry has been. Well, this inquiry, as I said, it wasn't a health inquiry. So it, it actually ended up being basically a tick in the box for the industry. So um, there, was, there was health, Health really uh, wasn't on the agenda. It was about what uh, what this industry can do for in terms of um, economics. Um, so the ORSA database. So the thing that we that most struck us, and this is um, really really important, was that um, we when we looked at the the data, and we looked when. Uh, it, researchers actually classify the data, uh, do experiments. They either use real mobile phones, they put the real mobile phones in the, in the, in the animal cage. And uh, yeah, most of these experiments are rats and mice, but um, there are some primates in there as well. So they put the mobile phone in the animal cage and they use a real mobile phone. The other thing they do it, it, to, um, they use simulated signals and these are not real mobile phone signals. And you can see real mobile phone signals, they vary in intensity quite dramatically. And, um, and what, what you're not told is that these are highly modulated signals. They contain um, two hertz, uh, GSM's got two hertz, uh, 8.33 hertz. Uh, Tetra, which is used for emergency services, got 16.7 hertz. Now all these low frequency, um, all these low frequency, um, um, impressed uh, on the on the carrier wave if you if you've got you've got the carrier wave and then on top of that you've got these these frequencies um, and the the main one is 217 hertz which is the um, data frame the repetition rate and uh, gsm 5g they're going to be using they're sticking with a, this still sticking with this frame rate now when they do these simulated signals that's the only one they put in there to 217 hertz. They don't put any of this other low frequency stuff in there. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a very, it is that, it's a simulated signal. And um, so when you look at the animal studies in vivo animal studies, you get 120 effect studies with, with real mobile phones and you get 18 no effect studies and 11. Now this is coming out of the ORSA database. So we classified the papers into effect, no effect and uncertain. And so that's very clear that real mobile phone signals are very bioactive. And the same with the cell studies, you can, you can look at them. But when you go across to simulated signals, it's not so clear. It's, it's looking more at 50-50. So the papers, the papers um, and these are pulse, these are using pulse. The, the other thing too is they use uh, continuous waves, which actually most of those studies show no effect. Uh, because if you can imagine, if you've got your body is being uh, hit 
uh, with a regular pattern of wave, your, your biological systems adapt and so they cope with that. But once you've got this very, very intermittent be, uh, wave behaviour, you've got a, 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 a leading edge and you've got a trailing edge which generate a physiological response. You, you, these, 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 this is the problem. This pulsing is a problem. But on top of that, you've also got these other frequencies, which are very low frequencies that our biology is very, very attuned to. Um, so that was actually quite a, quite a surprise for us. And, um, and we noticed that we then looked a bit harder in the literature and we found that Dimitri Panagopoulos in Greece also found the same thing with studies. He was studying flies and also noticed the same thing, that the, the pulsing appeared to be um, make these signals very bioactive. Um, so what, what, do we, what do we find when we look at the OSA database? We can actually summarise the papers. As, as I said to you, we, uh, this is not like EMF portal or um, uh, PubMed. We actually um, uh, look at the outcomes. Um, there are 52 papers on brain cancer. Most of those are epidemiological papers. Uh, you can see there uh, brain tumours, 52 papers. Go down here, gene ex altered gene expressions. There's 160 papers uh, which show altered gene expressions. Um, you, you can go and select those papers. You can go into a database and do a query and select all those papers and put them in a spreadsheet and go and look at them. You know? this, is what, this is what we've done. If you look at um, DNA damage, mutagenic uh, genotoxic, 157 papers in that area. Now, a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of um, uh, my colleagues say, well, look, hang on, wait a minute. The, the, these, um, uh, these, this, low, this low power density, uh, uh, it, it, look, it, it's, it can't interact at the atomic level and therefore it can't break covalent bonds. So how, how, can it, how can it cause DNA damage? And I said, well, yeah, it does, but it does it indirectly. It's reacting at the molecular level and actually um, changing uh, electrons on protein chains and uh, breaking, breaking those chains. And it causes, and one of the overwhelming uh, bits of evidence is um, if you look down here, you'll see oxidative stress, reactive oxygen, free radicals. There's 256 papers in that area. It creates what, what are called reactive oxygen species. And the body has to deal with those. And we, we, it happens naturally as well. But uh, the, this is another stressor. It adds to what uh, our bodies have to deal with on a daily basis. This actually adds another stress level to that. Now, I'm not a biologist or a biochemist, but they tell me that uh, people who, uh, uh, children, for example, um, the elderly, people like me, <laughs> old people, um, who their immune system is actually dampening down and they are, um, and people who are unwell are, are going to be more affected by this technology. Um, so that the, the doctors and biochemists and biologists tell me that. And you know, what's really interesting is that ICNERB has really no, um, no doctors on their panel. And they did have one. And she was actually from Australia, here in Queensland. And, but she's a, a UV specialist, she's a skin specialist. She hasn't really uh, looked in, she's, she's on the panel, but she's on there on, you've got to remember ICNERP also cover UV as well, non-ionizing radiation and lasers. Uh, but there, but she's on the panel for her UV experience, not on her panel for her RF, RF experience. So they've got one person, right? Whereas if you look at the other organisation, the International Commission on Radiological Protection, now it sounds like the International Commission for Non-Ionising Radiation Protection, the, the, the two acronyms sound the same, ICRP and uh, ICNERP, they sound the same, but they're completely different organisations. They, they've really got nothing to do with one another. And the, the ICRP was set up in 1928. Now they write guidelines for X-rays and gamma rays. And they were set up by, 
by radiographers mainly and radiologists and um, uh, doctors. They had very few uh, physicists. They did have a few, but they were in the minority. So when they set up those standards or guidelines for X-rays and gamma rays, they were very cautious in the way they, uh, particularly with low dose, low dose ionising radiation, <coughs> they were they were very cautious. Um, <clears throat> whereas, um, oh sorry, I'm just uh, they were they were um, they were very cautious in the way they 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 set up those standards, and particularly when it came to low dose ionising radiation, those X rays and gamma rays. So you've got to remember that we're actually, we've got potassium 40 in our skeleton, we've got radium in the soil. We've actually, we've evolved with these primordial radionuclides. They're in the environment, our, our biology is involved with it. This stuff, this man-made radiofrequency st stuff, radiation, we haven't evolved with that. So it, it's, it's a lot more hazardous, particularly at the low, low, um, low exposures, low power density. It's much more hazardous than say ionizing radiation where we've got this adaptive response. Um, we do see adaptive response also with, um, with uh, non-ionizing radiation as well. But so this, this, um, this painted a picture for us. And um, when, when you look, as I said, th these are some of the categories um, that you see effects in um, increased oxidative stress. I was talked about there, uh, neurodegeneration, uh, alteration in, new, in um, neurotransmitter levels, um, blood breaches of the blood brain barrier, cognitive impairment function, mitochondrial de de dysfunction. These are, again, this is the mitochondria, or, um, or, um, the energy production within the cell um, is affected. Uh, DNA damage, we see that. Um, damage to sperm, um, cardiovascular disease. There's a whole host. Now, how anyone can dismiss all these bio effects of not having any health imp implications is, is beyond me, absolutely beyond me. I just don't understand it. How you can ignore these non-thermal effects is just, it's, it's, it's mind blowing. Um, and this is just to give you a bit of an idea. This is uh, from our database. These, these are non-thermal effects uh, papers uh, where the where the SAR level is less than two watts per kilogram. That's the that's the um, uh, that's the level uh, which your mobile phone um, is um, has got to comply with. And so when you look at all the papers in animal studies and these mainly rats and mice in this non-thermal area this way below way below the um, ignorant limit 69 percent of all those papers show biological effect and um 64 percent show no effect and there's uncertain effects um but that's overwhelming evidence that uh, this is affecting uh, biology and this, this is interesting, this slide, because um, some countries like um, China, India, Poland, and, and Ru Russia is an interesting one because they, they, um, the media jumps all over that. Uh, oh, the, the Russians, you know, <laughs> reds under the bed, you know, they, they want a lower, they want a lower, uh, a lower level because, um, you know, they're trying to damage, you know, uh, the, um, the economics of the, the free world. You know, uh, this is all nonsense. These, these countries have selected a lower standard because of the uncertainty. They've looked at the biological effects and decided, look, we're gonna set a level a hundred times lower. We think it's more prudent to do that. It's uh, more precautionary. Um, and we've also, it, Paris and Rome have also been more precautionary. Now this slide here is from Ericsson. This is an Ericsson slide. Uh, at, at a meeting of the International Telecommunications Union. And they pointed out at the, the this presenter pointed out, um, his name's down the bottom there. You can go and look it up. You can download this, it's, it's freely available on the net. He pointed out that, look, if, if you've got the 5G antennas on the top of these buildings, 
this is this if you look at um, 100 the limit which is 100 times lower in these in these countries we're going to have a problem with this trying to roll out this technology this is um, this is going to cause us a, a problem so what's the solution to that this problem ICNERP decided in their latest release of their standard to relax those standards right to to allow for this to happen that that is that that is uh, very scary. Um, when you um, when you look at the papers and you you when, when we've done this in the AUSA database, we've said who's funding this, and we've categorised um, whether industry's funding it or whether um, government's funding it or, or uh, and a lot of the papers don't actually say who's funding it. So this is the big unknown here. Unless they specifically say in the paper we are being funded by so and so, they just they might write some glib statement like uh, no conflict of interest. Well, they they'll go into this no unknown because they haven't specifically stated it. So we're looking at where they actually specifically state they're being funded by industry or they're being funded by government or the institutions funding. We've actually we've actually ticked a box and and that's on one of our screens. And, and so you can see here when government fund it and institutions fund it, it's overwhelmingly uh, an effect study. Uh, the, the scientists report that, look, we, we found an effect. Um, whereas when industry funds it, um, there's no effect study. I should have also said within our database, we actually asked a PANZA for all their papers and they actually provided it to us in a text file. So within our database, we've got all the APANZA papers that they've collected over the years. We've also got uh, Henry Lai's um, collection of papers. They're also in our database as well, and they've been categorised. And Henry Lai also, um, he categorised the papers into effect and no effect. And, and we line up with him. There's about 18 papers that we disagree. We think he's got the wrong classification. But we have another we have another category which we call uncertain effects, which he didn't didn't have. So a lot of those 18 papers fall into this uncertain area, where it, you know. So um, yeah. So just to to say, you know, it's a it's a complete for the RF um, RF studies. It's a very complete data, very complete uh, uh, picture of all the all the scientific papers out there. Something that's often missed as well is that the institutions are funded or the departments are funded by industry. I know in the United States, we have several uh, universities where Sprint, AT&T, Verizon, they are funding the whole, the entire program. And yeah, that's one not of the, noted on the papers. Yeah, one of the, one of the problems we've got the universities here in Australia, and I think it'd be the same in America, is that unless industry is funding the research, it's not going to get done. Uh, and that's a, that's a real problem because our universities are saying, well, you know, we're not going to do the research until somebody coughs up the money. Um, that's certainly not true in places like Iran and Turkey. Um, they seem to do research, which is um, uh, in, uh, not, not sort of um, being driven by dollars. Um, so the research, the, the days where um, researchers in Australia did uh, work uh, on the basis they were given a grant to do research is, is over. The National Health and Medical Research Council here in Australia, which gets money, gets uh, le some money from industry, a levy, which is levy uh, from industry, and the uh, also um, they they get um, a grant from government. It's basically about a million dollars a year. They get um, uh, six hundred thousand dollars from industry and about four hundred thousand dollars from um, from government. So they get a million dollars a year to do research in this area. Now the the research that's done in this area is all psychological research. It's all being done at w Wollongong University by Rodney Croft. <laughs> it's it's not it's it's not uh, it's not animal research. They're not doing any animal research. And the, the last time they funded an animal research program was um, down in South Australia, one of the universities down there. And the, the um, a meritorious professor who was doing that work uh, on 
I think they were using rats. I can't remember now. It's something. Um, it was a rat experiment. She, at the end of the um, at the end of the research program, she said, "Look, I, we we see we see effects here. Um, look, we'd like to continue on and do more research on this." And they said, "No, no, there's no more funding for that." The interesting thing, the panel that decided where the money was going, one of the people on that panel was uh, an industry person um, because they, they were putting in money into, into the research. They were also trying to direct it in a certain area. So all the research that's been done in Australia has all been psychological research, research that on provocation studies, you know, so a lot of that money has been wasted as far as I'm concerned, uh, which is um, uh, the, the industry has also said, look, um, we don't need to continue to fund this type of research anymore through the National Health and Medical Research Council. We, we've got our answer. The answer is it can abstain it. We haven't got a problem. There's no, no health outcomes associated with this. So we're going to actually cut that funding. So it's going to get very interesting in the next year or so when that funding actually dries up completely. So there'll be absolutely no research in Australia being done in this area. So this is a real problem because um, as I said, uh, we're, um, most the universities now are wedded to uh, where the dollars are coming from. This is interesting research and uh, I've been uh, communicating with Hans uh, Gusnink. He's, um, he's a Netherlands scientist who uh, has been looking at biocompatibility and um, frequency windows, um, where the, where the, uh, and these dots are actually papers. So he's gone through and looked at the paper, uh, the research in a particular frequency area, and he's got these bands of, bands of frequencies that are, that are uh, as a result of his modeling. And, um, and he spent the last 20 years doing research in this area with another colleague. And um, they have a, um, they have an algorithm to work out whether the effects uh, uh, of a particular frequency can be beneficial or detrimental. The green areas are beneficial, the dots are papers, and he's put them into various areas. Now, this is low frequency stuff. This is 418, uh, you know, these are 249 hertz to, to 487 hertz. So he's been looking in the low frequency area. He's also started to look at the higher frequencies, the communication frequencies, and he's noticed the same sort of banding. His, this model that he's got is actually quite a good model. And um, I don't, this is, uh, he talks about quantum entanglement. He talks about uh, quantum physics. Look, I haven't done that for 50 years. <laughs> so this is, this is all, uh, ancient uh, knowledge, you know, uh, some of the, when I read, when I read his papers, I think, oh, gee, this is really over my head. But, um, but this, this uh, theory that he's got actually looks to be quite a good theory. And um, as I said, he's been working on it for 20 years and he, he wants to continue doing this work, but, but now finds that um, it looks like the research funding is drying up in this area. But um, this is actually quite, 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 quite interesting work, and um, we we should be we should be investing in looking at um, biocompatibility of these signals. You know, what are, is there? Um, can we make these signals more biocompatible? Uh, is there is there a way of doing that? And um, I've I've spoke to people about um, uh, besides uh, uh, RF transmitting these signals uh, through wireless uh, at RF frequencies, you can also do the same thing uh, at, um, you can also do the same thing with, with light. Um, and uh, there's, there's an emerging technology called Li-Fi, which is light fidelity. And um, I've noticed Siemens now are actually looking at this commercially. And the, the thing about that is the digital signals can be uh, put through um, lighting systems but most of the street lighting these days was all digital i got a friend who's a lighting engineer and he said look Vic, you know why 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 are you building all these towers everywhere you've actually got um you've got the infrastructures already there you've got all the street lighting is all digital you could you could put the pulses in the lighting and i said oh yeah but what about ambient lighting well that's not a problem either 
so there's a there's a whole area of research there that needs to be looked at. Other people have said, oh yeah, but you know, light light also can affect biology. Um, having all these pulse signals um, at, at these light frequencies, you know, what what's the research in that area? How does that affect um, our our skin? You know, absorption. You know, so that but it, but it's it it's interesting to me that that we don't have to build it the infrastructure it's already there you know we've actually got it most people have got digital lighting in their homes we really should be looking at the biocompatibility of these signals and how how we should be changing the technology um, in the rf area to make them more biocompatible and um and then, uh, so this is my last slide basically which says um on one side we've got um 5G, the Internet of Things, instant movie downloads, driver's cars, yeah, Wi-Fi and nappies, <laughs> in nappies or uh, diapers, as you call them. I mean, you know, we, we um, that should be banned. I mean, the, we, we banned X-ray machines. You, you, a lot of people probably don't know, but uh, after the war, they had machines that um, you could step on with your, with your feet inside the shoe. And you could look down and see an X-ray of your your foot in the shoe and see how well it fitted your shoe, but it was also radiating your gonads as well. Uh, so they they um, ICRP, that other organisation I talked about, um, who regulate X-rays and gamma rays. They they said, look, um, there's an optimization process here. There's no benefit. The, the benefit is really small compared with the detriment. And um, therefore, um, you know, these machines should be banned, and they were. They were taken off the market. So where's the where's the um, where's the regulator saying, hey, look, Wi-Fi nappies isn't a good idea. Uh, it might be might be okay for uh, baby boys who, the, you know, sperm sperm their um, function hasn't the, the testicles haven't really developed, and they're not producing sperm. But with girls, they've got all the eggs on board. You know, this is uh, there's no benefit in this. It's it, all we can see is detriment. Therefore, we should ban Wi-Fi and nappies. It's not a good idea. You know? and so this this sort of technology, um, there's nobody policing it. It's with having a standard that ICNERP's got, uh, which is set in basically the levels are set in the stratosphere. There's there's no um, there's no optimization process. There's no um, because the levels are so high, you're never going to exceed them. And uh, if you the technology starts to uh, increase the background levels, well, that, that's easy. We just we just pop the level up again. <laughs> you know, so we're under it. I mean, this is just nonsense. And and particularly, the, there's no discussion about you know the effect on wildlife. There's lots of papers on on birds uh, navigation being affected by this technology and bees in particular because once the once the frequency is uh, uh, the same uh, the wavelength is the same as the object you actually get maximum power transfer so uh, this is a real worry water and oxygen you know there are resonant frequencies uh, that they've got to be worried about particularly when you get into the um, into into the um, millimeter waves, so there's a whole. Um, so on one side you've got uh, humanity or the, the world, uh, and uh, and you've got the other side 5G. Where's the optimization? Uh, in as I said, in X-rays and gamma rays, we actually sit down and we think, well, okay, here are the benefits, here are the de here's the detriment. Where's the weighing of that? It's we don't have to. With, with this technology, because we've got the ICNERP have got it in the stratosphere, we don't have to weigh up the optimization. It's, it's, it's not part of their process. Risk management isn't part of their process. They don't, they don't they just ignore it. And they say now it protects everyone. Uh, it, there's, there's no, no, when I say, pro, no, I shouldn't say protect. It, 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 um, there's, there's, it, there's no, there's no problem. It, 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 this standard now is suitable for everyone. There's, there's no, there's not a problem. We don't, we don't have to worry about um, the ch children and the elderly. 
uh, and um, people who are sick. We don't we don't have to worry about that because uh, this standard this standard copes with that. This this standard is um, covers that. And a precautionary approach, we don't have to look at that either. That's that's not a problem. You know, we we've got that covered in this standard. It's, well, it's uh, like, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say that the the standard was set decades ago based on animal studies where they had a, a thermometer um, in the animal. The animal had a behavioral disruption, which they identified at four watts per kilogram. Mm. And since then, that limit has not changed as what they've identified as the level of adverse effect. And every study that comes along that shows an effect, they say does not count for this reason or that. They criticize or as was done in the case of Dr. Henry Lai, they war game the science. Mm. And even though that, that limit was never set based on trees, bees, you know, insects, mm -hmm. our natural environment. And that's been raised a lot now uh, in the European Parliament just had a, a, uh, a panel presentation on this issue. And there was some presentation on impacts, impacts to plants and bees. Mm -hmm. But then just yesterday, or actually my morning uh, in the United States, was a panel presentation on the disinformation campaign with mostly people tied to industry and mm. ignorant members. Well, a, a panzer here in, in Australia, they, they say, oh, look, this technology is um, safe because um, uh, we, 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 we use it in radar guns. Uh, we use it at airport, airport scanners. Hang on, wait a minute. You get in an airport scanner, you, you're, uh, it's five seconds, ten seconds scan. You're, you're out of there. You know this isn't this 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 isn't comparable. This is misinformation. You know our our um, pseudo regulator is telling us that that this technology is equivalent to being scanned at an airport, um, going in an airport scanner. You know this we're going to be irradiated 24/7. And and that the, the Russians came to that opinion um, two decades ago when ICRP had a workshop and they invited the uh, the head of uh, the Russian um, Russian Radio, uh, Radiation Protection Bureau along, and um, in, in that workshop um, they said, look, uh, you know, we, we we'd like the standard, the ICNIP standard, the heating standard, the acute heating standard, but to be adopted all around the world, you know, and you're 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 the only only country which is holding out against it, um, and he said, "Well, can, you know, the the um, six minute ICNIRP standard isn't applicable to population densities which are getting exposed twenty four seven at much much lower power densities. We don't know what the biological effect is, but we can see from all the science that the, these bio effects." are real, these non-thermal bioeffects are real at these low power densities. So we're going to select a standard hundred times lower. And that so that that was their that was their reasoning that this this um, ICNIRP short term heating standard is not is not applicable to what people are getting exposed to 24 seven at a much, much lower power density. So, um, and that's where that's 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 been our focus. The these non-thermal effects, and um, they're real. They're real. But ICNIRP say, well, you know, these exposures uh, don't have any health implications. The body is able to adapt. And it's interesting in their 2002 statement, uh, they said um, different groups in the population may have differences in their ability to tolerate a particular non-ionizing radiation exposure. For example, children, the elderly, and some of the chronically ill people might have a lower tolerance for one or more forms of non-ionizing radiation than the rest of the population. Now, this is ICNIRP 2002, right? Under such circumstances, it may be useful or necessary to develop separate guidelines for different groups, that children and the elderly and people in, in hospitals, separate groups within a general population, uh, but it may be effective to just adjust the guidelines for a general population to include these groups. In other words, lower it to include these groups. Now, that statement in 2002 that ICMA had in, this, in their guidelines has been removed. This standard now protects everyone. 
You know? this, this is nonsense. So what do you say to uh, the reassurances of safety that uh, ICNR commissioners are presenting? Because there, that limit is being used by many countries around the world. Well, um, we, we wrote, um, wrote a, to your FCC, you know, we did yes. a submission to the FCC. We've done submissions to our, to our government. We're basically being ignored. Um, they don't. They don't want to know about it. It's um, it's the economic imperative, which is driving the agenda, uh, and even more so now with COVID nineteen, because um, governments like uh, the Australian government are actually uh, had to um, assist people who who don't have jobs. Um, so there's uh, there's been huge um, huge amounts of expenditure by our government, which mean debt. Um, so they're they're looking for ways to get revenue. So uh, yeah, it's um, this um, COVID nineteen uh, um, has uh, really um, assisted um, the uh, rollout of five G because um, um, governments are now looking for re for revenue. Um, mm. It's um, it's really concerning because, uh, as I said, the health. The health implications can be quite weak. Health can be quite large, and the detriment uh, to general population could be large. We're not looking at that. When it, there's no optimization process, as I said, the International Commission on Radiological Protection goes through an optimization process. There's none of that happening at ICNRP. They've just set the limit so high you can do whatever you want. You can have Wi-Fi in, in nappies and diapers. You know, you can have. Um, you don't have to worry about, you know, and you know, there's been uh, mobile phones uh, uh, are basically um, a complete worry because um, back in 2000, 2004, when they did the Interphone study and the CERNA study, um, most of the people who had mobile phones back then were, were just um, were just business people. Uh, now we've got the situation where um, everybody's got a mobile phone. That's you know, it's like, um, like, yeah. It, I mean, it, the proliferation of this technology has been huge because of its um, handy. It's handy. It's useful. Uh, you know, but that nobody's looking at the detriment. Well, you know, we should have a really good, strong consumer device. When these devices are actually sold, people should be told, "Look, yeah, you know, you could get you could get a, a brain tumour if you continue to use this mobile phone for hours a day stuck to your ear, you're probably going to end up with a, with some sort of tumour. You might be lucky, it might be a non-malignant tumour, an acoustic neoma or vestibular uh, sweoma, but it, but it might be a glioma. You know, the probability is it could go either way, you know, but hours a day of um, having the phone up to your, up to your head it's not a good idea. And so people, consumer device, we should be telling consumers, hey, this is the proper way to use it. They don't, of course, industry doesn't want to do that because uh, the problem is um, it's opening up an area of litigation. And, uh, and we've, seen what, we've seen what's happened in um, Turin in Italy now with those uh, two court cases. Um, it, it's, it's, look, it's like um, smoking all over again. I mean. You know, there should be warning on the packets. There should be warning. There should be a sticker on the mobile phone that, that has radiation warning on it, so people people take notice. They they can they can choose. They can choose to jam it up to your head, or you can choose to have it on a cord. You know, but if but not providing the advice to them, you that, know, that's that's wrong. Yes, and in the United States, the city of uh, Berkeley passed a law where people would be informed when they bought the phone with a statement which was very factually correct that when the phone is in the bra or in the pocket and touching the body, then it can mm. exceed FCC limits for radio frequency radiation. Mm. And it won in the courts for several years until this year when the FCC, our US government agency who supposedly has oversight over the wireless industry, but is in fact captured by industry because the commissioners are, several of the commissioners are former uh, insiders in the wireless industry. Anyway, they filed in the case 
and it was lost after several years. It's actually put on hold, not implemented now. Mm. And that was a way that people could be informed in Berkeley, California. Mm. Previously, uh, San Francisco had passed a similar but different law. And the same thing happened where the wireless industry sued the city and said it was uh, over warning. Mm. And I know when I spoke um, with uh, the groups in England that when they have put posters up or advertisements about this issue, that it they comes down soon after because the ad council has received complaints that the information was not true when it when it was true true information like research has found brain cancer research has found headaches so yeah. it's a real challenge to even inform people mm. through any channel on this issue because mm. there's so much uh, money involved in deep pockets and people mm. whose full-time jobs are simply to stop this information, it seems, yeah. from becoming just well-known. I mean, phones emit what radio frequency radiation. I certainly didn't know that before I knew about this issue. Mm. Why yeah, was I told? Yeah, well, um, you know, talk about misinformation. I mean, um, the industry is now saying this is new radio. Uh, what? <laughs> Trying to trying to paint this, yeah, it's, it's classified as new radio. New radio. It's like, yeah, it's like an extension. Uh, when you hear new radio, what do you think? You think, oh, that's just an extension of the AM AM FM band. No, it's not. It's completely different. I mean, that's misinformation. New radio. Yeah. So there's a, there's a you know who. who yeah, misinformation is a, is a huge problem. And, you know, Dr. Dr. Carl, um, who's a um, very well-known um, uh, do doctor who speaks on our ABC radio, as our, like your national public radio, um, he, uh, he was being interviewed and uh, he was saying, oh, the N NTP study, oh, you know, the, the rats who got exposed live longer, you know, and this is uh, basically trying to uh, poo-poo the study. I mean, um, you've only got to watch uh, Ron Melnick's uh, video and um, you, you, uh, just talk on, on the EHS Trust to know that, hey, no, this is a serious study. This is not, this is not, this is not uh, a, a joke study. Um, and, and this, Dr. Melnick has published on the issue of the, yeah. the criticisms being unfounded. He, yeah, and, in health yeah. physics, he, he, exactly what you raised, that the mm. animals live longer. In fact, that didn't influence the statistics that no. showed effects for the specific groups. So yeah. it really doesn't, that criticism doesn't hold up when you look at the data. Yeah. At all. That, yeah, that's so, exactly, that's exactly right. But but again, that's misinformation, isn't it? I mean, yes. you know, this this um, doctor is on public radio telling everybody, look, there's not a problem. You continue to jam that mobile phone up to your head. You know, you're not going to have a problem, um, which is uh, which is really criminal. Um, and one of the you were talking about um, uh, breast cancer. Um, one of our doctors actually just sent me a very interesting paper. And um, it, it looks like the the um, the he's it's a breast cancer study. Um, in um, I, I've um, yet to have a look at it, but basically uh, the sort of risk factors are very similar to um, the risk factors associated with any lung cancer if you're a, if you're a light smoker. So the, these risk factors aren't trivial, and um, we should be taking notice of them. Yeah, it's very, it's, um, yeah, it's very difficult. There was a, a study that came out funded by the American Cancer Society, and they looked at people with thyroid cancer and found that the heavy users of cell phones who had a specific genetic susceptibility had a higher risk for thyroid cancer, which is increasing across the world uh, thyroid cancer. And mm -hmm. um, that study which I've raised with uh, Rodney Croft of ICHNR and also uh, to the World Health Organization EMF project. Um, where is the discussion on that, on people's 
genetic susceptibility, where when people say that it's safe, mm -hmm. that assumption, it doesn't hold up once you start looking at the science and there's all of these all of these endpoints to look at, which you've documented in your database. And mm. um, I'm so thankful for your work. I, I wonder if you had any comment on genetic susceptibility and that issue, which I think is very important and has. Yeah, well, as I said, altered gene, gene expressions, there's quite a lot of papers in that area as well. And, uh, but you talk about Rodney Croft and um, ICNERP, it just shows you what sort of organization ICNERP is it's not a it's not really a health uh organ health setting organization i mean they've got an academic psychologist heading up uh a panel a a, a commission or a, a group to decide on guidelines uh, you know to health guidelines um as i said you've, you've really got to compare that to the international commission uh, on Radiological protection, ICRP, and um, look at look at the look at the, the look at the health uh, input into that group, and compare that with ICNERP, the International Commission on Non-Ionising Radiation Protection. Uh, and and you're right. Back in 1980, uh, when um, uh, I can remember. Um, um, Michael Rapicholi actually visiting our lab, the Australian Radiation Labs, and we were sitting down at morning tea and having a talk about standards. And he he was saying, "Look, you know, we, we've got to have standards in this area. Um, we we all we had was was microwave ovens in those days. There was basically no uh, no mobile phones. There was a few uh, a few in cars in those days. So it wasn't even really on the agenda. But um, yeah, I can remember him sort of saying, well, we've got to start putting standards in this area. Um, I just wonder how how uh, the industry, it, 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 is it a, it's, it's a planned involvement. It's, it's not just happening out of accident. Um, they, they're, they're looking at where the next development will go. And um, with this 5G now, of course, uh, the densification of um, EMF in in suburb areas is going to be huge. It is, it, it, but the, the problem we've got now in Australia is we have no real background measurements. I'm not talking about six minute measurements, right? I'm talking about measurements over 24 hours, 48 hours over a week to gather the data, to know what the real background is like and to look at how that's increasing over time. We've got no data on that. There is no data on that. It's not like in radiation, it, before, we, we, before we start mining, uh, opening up a uranium mine, we actually do background measurements to work out what the level of radon gas levels are before we start mining. And then we model what the situation is gonna be in the pit when miners start working. And then we monitor through that process, you know? That sort of philosophy of radiation protection is completely lost on ICNERB, absolutely completely lost on them. They, they don't measure the background. We, we've got, basically, we don't know how the background's changing over time. It's all a bit of a mystery to us. We know it's increasing. We've got quite a few papers that show that. But, and, and it's, it, it, but this move to 5G is a, is a, a, a quantum leap move uh, with antennas on every street pole, every two or three hundred meters, this and they're, they're probably going to put something on your house that's going to pipe the 5G frequencies into your house. I mean, this is this is uh, this is a huge change, not a small change. And people yeah. are people are um, people are w woken up to this. That that they, um, they are. Yeah. We argue that in our case, our uh, legal action against the FCC, that 5G is really a new environment for radio frequency radiation because of the densification of antennas, the different mm. frequencies, the different modulations, the machine to machine communication. It's not just about your phone. We're entering into in, in the next level, uh, really unleashed is the good is the word. And that is the word that industry uses as mm. well. But I wanna go back mm. to what you said about measuring because it's so important. So mm. in the United States, we used to have 
uh, field officers for the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission, that did measurements, um, not comprehensive all over the country, but there were measurements being done. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, the last report on that was from the mid 80s uh, that mm -hmm. was done with the EPA, uh, yep. EPA, FCC, um, and, and other countries such as uh, France, Greece, Turkey, India, Israel, French Polynesia, Croatia, Bulgaria, Tunisia, Switzerland, a lot in Switzerland, Bahrain and Iceland do have various programs of varying degrees of uh, real-time measuring. They put, they post it publicly online. They, um, mm -hmm. if you, in France, you can request what is mm -hmm. the radio frequency level in mm -hmm. near my home. And the mayor has to submit that and you get results. You find out what the levels are. Mm -hmm. But in the United States, we're not, we don't even know what the measurements are. Mm -hmm. uh, at all before yeah, well, and after. Yeah, well, this is the job of the regulator. The regulator should be out there doing these measurements. We're actually talking to a company um, and um, we, we've, we're actually, um, he, they've been looking at designing a, um, a measuring device that works 24 seven uh, oh, that they can deploy. Uh, and uh, we've been looking at the frequency windows, you know, what frequency windows we, we pick. Now we we're, we're actually as an organisation we're thinking of funding that that um, that research to to get the to get the devices out there, and um, we've been talking about you know schools for example um, there's been um, quite a few reports from schools where they've rolled out uh, new um, Wi-Fi uh, uh, routers and um, they you know kids are being sick and nauseous and. Uh, and that and so they contact schools have contacted us and said look can you come out and do some measurements and we said well we we, we don't really have all that that equipment but um they said well you know we we need to we need to be monitoring in these spaces uh because um the kids are getting sick and people are starting to draw the association between these new wi-fi router, routers and the fact that kids are some kids are getting nosebleeds um uh you know we need to measure in this space and so um, the, we, we're looking at um, uh, also themselves ourselves are looking at working with this company to actually devise monitors with, that can be put in an area that can monitor for a whole month, so you can see the variations. Now uh, we 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 we're, we're thinking that probably if it was uh, four or five hundred dollars a month, people could rent these and put them in an area, and then they could get a report after a month on, on the variations of the levels. Um, but uh, schools is an interesting one because um, there's been a lot of um, uh, agitation by, by different groups saying, look, we, we should be, you know, you go into classrooms and there's wall-to-wall -wall computers and, um, and um, those routers in all the classrooms and, you know, what, what are our kids getting exposed to? Um, so a PANSA decided to, to do some measurements in that space. So they set up a program to monitor in schools in New South Wales here in Australia. And um, they, um, they, they, uh, when we saw their published report, we actually wrote a letter to the editor. There was no kids in the classroom. They went into the classroom. The classrooms were empty, yeah. right? They went into the classroom and they plonked a a PC down on the table and walked around the classroom, did one minute average measurements and said, oh, this is a typical classroom. Hang on, how can this be a typical classroom? You know, if you've got kids sitting next to one another with notebooks and there's 50 kids in the classroom, all, all surfing the net, you know, you can't, you can't say that what you've done is a typical classroom, it's not. So they went to 30 schools and monitored empty classrooms. Now, what sort of nonsense, what sort of nonsense research is that? And we wrote a letter to the editor saying, look, this, this, is, um, this is nonsense. It, it, this isn't typical. And they, they wrote back and said, yes, it is. And, and then we pointed out to them that the routers, um, the routers actually, um, what, what happened in, in one of the universities, uh, Queensland University of Technology, they, have, they designed a new lecture theatre, right? 
and they and they decided to put um, put routers in the ceiling, and and they they um. They didn't really understand the science. They just placed them every few meters. They thought more routers, you know, there's the kids that the um, students, you know, would get access to them, blah, blah, blah. Then they, when they, when they, so they rolled out all these routers in the ceiling and, and when they came to do the measurements at, at the, when they came to use the um, computers at desk level, they couldn't log on. There was no signal. And, the, and wow. anyway, the, um, yeah, so the, the radiation uh, protection advisor at the time uh, rang me and said, "You know, what do you what do you think's going on?" I said, oh, "I don't really understand this." And then he he discovered that there was some of the routers were on on um, uh, on one network and some of the routers were on the other network. So what happens is the two routers, right? They've got what they call dynamic resource management in the routers. So it sees it sees noise from the other router, it sees the other router as noise. So it powers down. The technology in it powers the router down. So so the two routers were basically seeing one another and powering down because they saw it as noise. So there was no. So the people running out this, the engineers running out this technology didn't really understand what they were doing. Uh, and this is uh, this is a real problem because this, and we pointed this out that uh, the these routers also have in them dynamic resource management, um, and um, but they they completely ignored that. They, yeah, oh look, it, it it's just it's just laughable. Um, and and uh, yeah, what, what can you say? You know, you you do a, a survey of um, thirty schools, and uh, you do a survey of empty classrooms, and you walk around the room with a with a probe doing one minute one minute averages. You're in and out in thirty minutes, and you tell us that's typical. Well, you know, that's the sort of nonsense science. Uh, that's misrepresenting uh, the true situation, and um, yeah. it, it's it's a real concern because uh, you know. We're, we're trying to be um, fair-minded and, and uh, helpful, uh, but they just, they, you know, they, they, um, they're prepared to, um, uh, to mis misrepresent the science. Um, and, um, you know, all we can do is basically write a letter to the editor and, and right. tell them, no, they got it wrong. Uh, and, uh, you know, but this people is People don't the science. They don't, they'll see the published paper. They don't always see the comment. Yeah, yeah, and it's like the uh, brain brain cancer study they did uh, in mm -hmm. in Australia. Um, yes, the over six the over the, the we we're in Europe where they're seeing uh, in the UK and the Netherlands and Sweden, and and I think I've even seen a paper in America where in the older age groups, my age group, they're starting to see an increase in in gliomas uh, and brain cancers. Yes. And um, and of course, these are ecological type reports. You know, you, they don't focus on mobile phones, but that's the the major major changes in right. the environment. Uh, and um, so they're seeing an increase in in these types of uh, brain tumors, these nasty brain tumors. They're seeing an increase, and uh, in the over 60s. So Panzer do a um, do a review. Uh, of the epidemiology of the um, of the disease studies, um, they get the statistics from the government and look at whether it's increasing. But they they ignore the over sixties group, right? They don't they don't put that in their review. They do see an increase, but they put that down to um, better detection techniques. Now, now that doesn't make any sense either because the reality is that if you you get a brain cancer. Uh, one of these nasty gliomas or uh, glioma blastoma multiform, the GBMs, you, you're probably dead within a year and a half. So uh, the detection, uh, really uh, having better detection, this isn't isn't it doesn't show that it is is not is not the reason why why this there's a small increase because of better detection techniques. Right. It just doesn't doesn't make sense. And the other thing they did in 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 their review is they ignored the under twenties, the children, 
uh, and adolescents and that. They ignored that group. Um, now, we keep seeing in the press now that, that leukemia, uh, childhood leukemia, is um, now being rivaled by brain cancer in children. So, you know, you've got to ask the question, what's changed and why, why have they neglected the under the under 20s group? I mean, uh, children now um, are given mobile phones as toys, you know? You can't, can't, um, you can't neglect that group. Yeah, well, um, in the United States, the, that group has increases in brain tumors, uh, uh, incredibly high increases in uh, thyroid cancer and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the under 20 group in the United States. Uh, and another paper just came out um, talking about young adults as well having increased cancers. So the, the way that the studies are designed um, are so important to be looking at as we address each of these aspects because industry will say, well, they're, we're not seeing an increase in brain cancers and they point to that Australian study as proof. Yeah, you know, that um, we, we um, picked apart a PANS's um, review of the technology, review of the science, uh -huh. uh, the TR164 report. And uh -huh. um, as I said, we, we asked for a PANSA for all their, all their papers so that we could have a look uh, and classify the papers and uh, see how the study uh, went. And I don't know, um, I'll just, um, maybe I'll just minimise this. And um, but TR164 was a, a, re a review they did um, 2000, 2012. And um, I'll just... I'll pull up the. Um, I'll just pull up the um, pipe presentation on that, um, and um, uh, where are we? I'll just um, I'll just find that because I think it's really, really interesting to um, to look at this. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to find the. Um, uh, the paper, the slide, slides, there it is. Um, this is a, a talk I gave at um, one of the Australian Radiation Protection Society conferences. And um, I, um, oh, that's that pie chart I showed you before. It's quite large, but the, um, but this is quite interesting. This is their TR one six four review, and um, we 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 are we they in for example in in the area of uh, cell uh, um, physiology injury they they found twenty one effect papers and seventeen no effect papers, and when we got their data we asked them for their database because we wanted to look at the count up the papers which showed effect and we found 72 and 16. Now they found all the no effect papers, but there's 72 effect papers that they didn't find. And, um, and the reactive oxygen species, they didn't even do that. There's 124 effect papers and no effect papers. But if you look at genotoxicity and mutagenesis, they found eight papers which uh, showed effect. We found 34. Uh, we found, um, they found um, 10 no effect papers. We found 20. Um, when, so all the numbers here, uh, testicular function, they found eight uh, effect papers and five no effect papers. We found 25 and, and four. So in their TR164, they said, oh, there's 49% effect and 51% no effect. And we found 74, 26. And we said, what's going on here? You know, how can you, we've got your, we've got all your papers and we've classified them and we've got, um, uh, uh, we haven't got, um, we, we're getting completely different numbers. What's going on? And they said, oh, well, um, the expert reviewer in this area, uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't use their assembled copies of their database. He didn't use it. Who was and the expert said, reviewer? Uh, Andrew Wood. Oh, of course. Yeah, from Swinburne Technology. And so we said, um, look, um, 
how did he how did he get these numbers? And he copied a report from uh, a UK report, and he got the numbers out of a UK report. Now that UK report is um, um, Dr. Sarah Starkey uh, completely. Um, oh right, the, the yes. That, yeah, the, it's the um, AGNR report right? and uh, that panel. And, and she pointed out there were lots of scientific inaccuracies right? and they, they missed out um, uh, area bioeffect areas like oxidative stress, well, fertility effects weren't, cognitive function, behavioural effects. They were all misrepresented. And uh, so he's, he's taken this report and collated the numbers out of that report and that's where his numbers are. He didn't use their assembled 1,354 papers uh, that, that they'd assembled over that period. He didn't use that. He used, he just um, summarized. Now, now this, this, the interesting thing about this was um, in Canada, uh, one of the regulators said, oh, you know, look, the AGNR haven't found a, you know, haven't found a problem. It's 50-50, uh, right. we don't really know. And so have the Australians. Right, the, I know. A panzer, a panzer have also found the same thing. Hang on, it's the same report. <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, this, this is misinformation big time. This is really, this is, this is almost scandalous. And it, as it I is said, scandalous. It yeah, is scandalous and, and, and said, criminal. Yeah, and as I said, this is um, this is all all this is this is devious, isn't it? You know, this your this this story though is being repeated all over. So uh, all over the world in different countries where they don't have experts that are taking an independent look at the science, they're just taking reports that have already been done, which were made out of other reports, made out of other reports of a small group of scientists, many of whom are tied to industry, and it's really the same report. Or yeah, sections of it are the same, or even our USFCC, when we were addressing in, in our legal uh, appeal, yeah. when the FCC responded to us, they said, no, but look at what ICNRP says. Well, what are they doing going to ICNRP? Because they're the FCC. They're different sets of limits, although there's a lot of commonality. But suddenly they're pulling in ICNRP as validating their uh, decision not to uh, consider the National Toxicology Program findings as important to the United States. When the United States uh, FDA actually asked for that study because we didn't know, we didn't have the uh, experimental data on long-term exposure. This is going on all over. Yeah, I can't believe it's the same. Yeah, and we actually went to a lot of trouble to uh, look at ICNRP and and what they what the panel is composed of. Uh huh. And um, we uh, we you know you, you when you look at the panel of uh, the scientists on the panel, as um I can't seem to find it, but but basically it's it's on our website the. It, they're, they're basically a closed club. Yes. You know? they're, they're like a club of thermal scientists, you know. It, it, they, don't want to be, they don't want people in there that might have a different point of view. Um, so the invite just, only club. They invite, you can't just go and be a part of ICNR. Yeah. They yeah. invite you in. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think, like, I think a lot of people might have started out with, um, altruistic motives in uh, set in the 1980s, where they they wanted to set up standards um, to protect people, but this is, this is actually now we've got to a point where where it's it's being distorted, uh, which is um, and and you know back in 1980, who could have believed that we would have had this this type of technology now? And you know it's incredibly useful technology. And um, uh, and how do you how do you how do you um, stop a tower going up uh, in an area where where it's hurting people? How do you how do you how do you go about that? And um, Dr. Um, we, Dr. Russell Cooper, 
is, is uh, probably one of a handful of uh, doctors here in Australia who have actually looked at the signs and said, look, yeah, they're, they're, um, there are problems. Um, the, these people who are saying they're sick and that aren't just making it up. They're, they're, not, they're not psychologically, uh, they don't have psychological problems. These are, these are grounded problems. And, and the, the interesting one is um, there's a court case currently going on about it at the moment. Um, this guy was an electrician He's a very down-to-earth sort of person, you know. He's uh, he's an electrician. He's worked in at the industry uh, in the high-tension wire industry, um, transformers. He's been exposed to transformer oil, you know. He's been exposed to PCBs. He's he's um, he's worked in, as I said, the uh, not the uh, it, the companies that distribute the the, um, the power on. Uh, on the pylons, you know, he's worked for the, they, those companies. I won't mention who it is, uh, but, and he realised that he became um, electro hypersensitive. Now he um, he went to his employer and said, "Look, um, I have a I've got a problem. I, I seem to when I get around this uh, power lines and then I feel quite sick and uh, and I get headaches and it's like a brain pressure and." And that, so he went to his, and he, so his, um, his employer said, well, look, you're fairly senior now. We, we'll give you a desk job. Um, we'll give you a desk job and, and you can manage the rollout of transformers and um, you, can, you can help us in that area. So um, I'll, I'll stop share, sharing, will I? Um, Oh, sorry. I am sure oh. because we were talking. Oh, thought oh it thank be you. Better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So, um, so anyway, he he um, he realised he he'd become electro hypersensitive, and uh, and quite a few people in the, in the industry are. So they gave him a desk job. They said, "Look, you're a senior person. You you know what you're doing around this equipment. You know how to. We'll we'll get you to manage roll out of transformers in certain areas on power poles and that." So anyway, so he had a desk job and, and he had a hand phone, he, uh, you know, a normal, normal desk phone. Mm -hmm. So, and everything was fine. He, he got better. He, he, he was feeling good. But then they moved him to another office where they didn't have a desk phone. And they said, oh, you're going to have to use a mobile phone. And the minute he started using a mobile phone, he got quite sick. And the, uh, he had a, uh, a, another colleague working in the management role as well. And he started, he was also electro hypersensitive and he was using uh, a mobile phone as well and was getting affected. Um, so he went to his employer and said, look, um, I have a problem here. I, I can't work with these mobile phones. They make, I get headaches. Uh, it's the pressure is just immense. Um, I, um, I, I can't can't work. So they said, "Oh, look, okay, we'll we'll move you back to another area." And so he had he had the hand phone again, and the the other, the other chap who was working with him actually got a brain cancer. He's he's now dead, right? So anyway, so um, David said, "Well, um, look, uh, I can't work with these mobile phones. You're gonna, you, you, you know, they moved him back to another area where he had to use mobile phones." So anyway, he had a constant battle with his employer, and they said, "Oh, there's, you know, uh, there's, uh, we'll send you to our doctor." And um, the doctor said, "Oh, look, you know, there's not a problem. It's, uh, it must be all psychological with you, and blah blah blah." So, so he, he, um, he decided what he'd do. He'd, he'd move to the country. So he he moved his house and his family, and moved uh, two hours wow. into the country, right? And he found that on the week he'd go home at night, and that there was no um, uh, there was no mobile phone towers or anything there. So he, he would he would get a bit of you know as I said biological systems aren't linear. He recovered overnight, and he'd go back to work the next day. He'd feel sick. He'd come home. The weekend he got a bit more uh, of a respite uh, on the weekend. What happened? They decided to build wow. a mobile phone tower 300 metres away from his house. Wow. 300 metres. Yep. 
on the top of a hill. He was on the top of a hill in the country. Oh. Yep. So so anyway, he um he um he, he went around to all all his neighbours, and um, they said, "Oh no, we we don't want a mobile phone tower up on the hill there. It look bloody, it look ugly, you know. It's terrible, you know. And also uh, habitat. We've got koalas going through the area, and and you know, yeah, we." So 459 people objected to this mobile phone tower. They, the council had to, okay, give a tick in the box. So they objected to this mobile phone tower. So, uh, so I went to council uh, with all these 459 objections. There was one person who was for it. Uh, all the neighbours were against it. It didn't fit in with the Environmental Planning Act. But guess what? They approved it. Oh. So they built. So his house now is living hell for him. Sorry, I've, uh, oh, I can't you hear. You froze for a second. I'm sorry. Um, oh, okay. You That's said right. that, that one person wanted it, but then they they passed it. Yeah, the council the council approved it, even though it was against all their environmental planning laws. Right, it didn't fit in with the environment because this is uh, like a koala habitat area, um, and uh, so it's a. It, it, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so anyway, they passed it. So why did they pass it? What, uh, what, what was the motive for the council to pass this mobile phone tower? Uh, evidently, in another part of the council, there was this drive towards smart cities. Oh. It's going to make. You know, so the, the um, yeah. So anyway, so it's it's the subject now of a court case, mm -hmm. and um, Dr. Um, uh, Ray Broomhall and and Dr. Russell Cooper have of, um, of, um, involved in in this court case because uh, in in law in Australia it, it says that assault. If I if I stand next to near someone and yell at them. That's assault. So I don't have to throw. I don't have to hit someone. To assault. And in the in the um, in the legal in the legal wording, you can use electrical energy as assault. So so what so what the way the way um, the lawyer Ray Broomhall is treating this is that this tower is assaulting um, David. It's assaulting him. And therefore, he, all, he, all he, need, he, he, he they provided the evidence from a doctor showing that uh, David was electro hypersensitive. They provided that evidence. And, uh, but the um, communication provider went ahead and built it anyway, uh, it knowing full well that it was going to hurt someone. It was assaulting someone, so they're saying to the to the um, electrical uh, to the telecommunications provider, okay, um, this person's sensitive. We want you to some uh, to stop this energy coming across the boundary because you're assaulting my. So this this uh, it's a new way of looking at how to how to um, proceed with the law. So that case is still pending. So. Can't. It went. Uh, it went before the courts, and um, it, it was then uh, found in favour of the telecommunications provider. But the the information again, the judge didn't really understand. Uh, it was appealed against, and now it's in appeal. So um, so we, we're all waiting to see uh, what the what the outcome of that is. But uh, but yeah, you know, people who are electro hypersensitive, I I don't. I don't, you know, all the people I've met are very genuine, very intelligent people. Uh, they know this is hurting them and yeah. this is a problem. Yeah, well, thank you for, for sharing that story and giving us an update on that. I, I know that laws are different in the United States, um, but it's made perfect sense to me to treat it as an assault case because the, the electrical field uh, is, it has a rate of absorption into the body. So how is it not? I mean, if I make choices to remove all of the wireless, like in my home, I'm 
talking to you on a wired computer, I use a wired phone. Why should I then be exposed to a cell tower right outside my door when I didn't want one? I really, um, and that's penetrating into the bodies of myself and my children. It makes no sense that this is allowed. We should yeah, have well a that, <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that's right. I mean, and particularly the fact that he provided the medical evidence uh, to the company beforehand. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you know, a lot of his neighbours and that sort of supported him. Oh, the other, the other thing is there's a, a, a man in the, in the house next door, right? This is a rural environment. There's uh, it's quite large. There's an acre, acreage. Mm-hmm. Um, it, the man next door has got terminal cancer. He, he's mm. uh, lung cancer and he, he's dying. And uh, he's, he, he's found that um, this radiation, since they put up the tower, it's actually he's got sicker. Wow. Um, so he's also uh, complained. Um, and, and the interesting thing is that the, um, they're providing this wireless community, the reason they put the tower up is they're providing this wireless communication to all these uh, people around who could have actually had the, it could have been provided by fiber optic. They could have cabled the whole area and the cost of putting up this tower uh, and the cost of put it, rolling out the fiber optic is, is basically about the same. Yeah. So, it uh, it just beggars belief. Um, that, mm. Yes, it it's all the more important to to be working on this issue. And I thank you from across the world for the work that you've done in Australia, which is impacting countries around the world. And the work that we're doing here, as well as in every country, we can go to your database um, and do the research in within the system you know i think yeah i was just gonna yeah i was just gonna say sorry i was just gonna say if you want i can do a database um webinar if you'd like to do that and i could run through it you have that online right though the videos yeah 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 it's online but i can i can actually uh we get a lot of people we've got quite a lot of power users out there now so Mm -hmm. um they they've figured out how to use it properly Mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people who go on there and they they say oh you know when i try to try to do it it didn't work and i I say well go and go and look at the training videos Mm -hmm. but maybe um a short webinar might might actually be a good way to do it and um i can show you the power of of the of the database maybe maybe we could do that another time Great, great. Yeah, I think that that would be a great idea with a Q&A where people can say, you know, here, I have their real issues come up. You know, one other thing you raised that's really important is that as we go to the court, so we're in the courts here in the United States, in India, in Greece, in the United Kingdom, now it's going to the courts, which is inevitable and, and really where we need to be. Um, the issue is that when the industry messaging comes forward, if you don't know the subject, you might get confused. And that is a concern that we have and that we worked really hard to make the what we are saying understandable because this issue, as you know, is really complex between frequencies, yep. modulation, polarization. I mean, you start mm-hmm. actually talking about what is a thermal versus non-thermal. I mean, that itself is a whole nut, right? It's like, let's Let's spend a whole hour talking about what that means. Mm. And we'll get a bit close if you're new to it. If you don't know anything about this, but you know the law well, but you don't know thermal versus non-thermal or characteristics of a wave or, um, you know, what is a case control study? Why, how is that different from, uh, you know, other stu- other studies? It, it becomes easy to say, like in, in our case, uh, the FCC made a statement that, well, the SAR limits are based on a whole body limit that has a 50 times safety factor. Now, anyone who doesn't know anything would think, oh, there's a 50 times safety factor for the cell phone, SAR, mm-hmm. except that's not what they were saying. And there's all these problems with that. One, the whole body limit safety factor is based on thermal effects and, and we, everything that we know about, which is not 
adequately protected. So that's one bucket. But more importantly, the SAR limit is different for the localized. Uh, the local limit is different than the whole body limit. Um, yeah. And the whole thing becomes like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. everyone's like rolling their eyes going, what are you talking about? Localized limit? What is that? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So we need to educate people. I really believe that we need to educate people and our policymakers to understand this so that they can see through the smoke screen that mm. industry is presenting to us. Because mm. if you don't know certain things, it's easy to to see what you want to see, which is that there's no problem. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and that's uh, just uh, explaining what you were saying then about the SARS limit. Uh, I would say that it, amongst um, my colleagues in radiation protection is probably 150 in the Australian Radiation Protection Society. Probably three would would understand what you were talking about there. Right. So it's not just it's not just the general public right. that are confused. It's also the scientists don't haven't really looked at this. They, they it's a, it's a, it's low power low power density. It's not a problem. Right. You know. You know they they haven't really uh, looked at it. So when I, when I talk to when I give a talk like the one I I was showing there with TR one six four when I give a talk like that, they all come up to me afterwards and say, "Hey, what what's going on here? Right. This doesn't look right. This doesn't look right. This is not it's not why you do science." Right. That's cool. Well, so let me ask a question, and pardon me for not knowing this, uh, but was that TR-125 or... Uh, 164 report. Was that the last time they did a review of the science? Yep. yep. <laughs> oh, so you uh, have... 2000, 2000, it's 2000, 2000 and to 2012, but the, they assembled, they assembled 1,354 papers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they were going to uh, uh, look at that collection of papers mm -hmm. and and review the science from that. There's only only one they had uh, somebody reviewing the epidemiology. Now he looked at those papers and came up with 50/50. Uh, they had somebody reviewing the cell studies and uh, and the animal studies, and I showed you what a terrible job he did. Mm -hmm. And then there was. Rodney Croft, who re reviewed the provocation studies, who said in who said in that report, um, we we do see changes in the in the brainwave pattern uh, when uh, when we turn on the um, uh, when we turn on the mobile phone mobile phone antenna, right. but but um, they, those changes don't have any health implications. That's right. That's what they say. Yeah. So they, yeah. Then he did some of those. Well, I don't know at that time if he did, but he's certainly doing them now. Some of the brain wave research that they say in their papers with his mm. name on it that yeah. it is a biological effect, but that it's not a health effect, even yeah. though there hasn't been a study specifically to 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 make that connection. It's clearly there are biological effects, mm. and there's so much we don't know. But there's mm. enough that we know. I mean, our position is that there is enough that we know that there needs to be action on this. Until there's the, the funding to the adequate independent science mm. uh, so that we can really fully understand this. Mm. Yeah. Um, and the, the Russians are right. They're, they're saying, look, we've, we've got the heating limit up here, mm -hmm. but you can't extrapolate it's very, you know, with you can't extrapolate that level down mm -hmm. to what members of the public are getting exposed to, and you can't you can't n ignore all these non-thermal effects, these other bioeffects. You can't ignore them, and so you know the, the people who are setting lower lower power density limits are, um, are, are are doing it as a precaution, the precautionary approach, and that that's what we do. So have you, has in Australia, did they do similar to what ICNRP did, a response to the National Toxicology Program criticizing the findings? What happens with all the studies that are coming forward, showing adverse effects? Why is the government of Australia not looking at those and re reviewing this and coming up with safety limits that are known to be safe? Mm. Yeah, good question. Um, 
yeah, it beggars belief, doesn't it? That um, that we, you know, just glossing over that and um, and then trying to find pick holes in those reports that that um, oh, that yeah, but the the rats live longer. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, it's sort of nonsense. Um, yeah, and you know, as you said, the general public uh, don't really understand. Um, it's, right. As you say, it's complicated. Yeah. Science is complicated, and um, yeah, it's um, yeah. We just keep um, plugging away, and um, you know, some people are listening. Yes, I think so. I think awareness is growing worldwide on this mm. issue. There is no question because. And they start putting those poles up in front of people's homes. Mm. They take the time to look into it and mm. make decisions like you would anything in your house. Like if if there's all these scientists saying don't use something, and then there's scientists saying it's fine, but they're paid by industry or there's industry connections. What would you do? You know, with if it were a drug, would you take it? Or what if you didn't need it and you could use a safer option? What would you choose? I mean, I feel like we can deal with this like we deal with. Uh, anything even in our home, decisions we make in our home, choose the safest option. And it's then you have you have people who um, present medical reports and to industry and say, look, look, I am, I am electro hypersensitive. I, I've known about. I'm an electrician. I've I know I know I know I am, and uh, I've got doctors' evidence, doctors' reports here, um, mm -hmm. telling you that, and um, I'm telling you not to put what not to build this. 300 meters away from my heart house, mm -hmm. they go and do it anyway. And, uh, you know, we, we don't believe you, you know, you've got a psychological problem. Uh, yes. Uh, I know that's purported by your, by, by scientists in Australia of Ichner. There's yeah. a psychological problem, not, a, yeah. not real. Well, thank you so much for your time. We've, we've gone on yep. for so long and I thank you. And I hope we can do this again and do a webinar yep. on um, the database. That would be great. We should set that up for 2021. Yeah, and also thank you uh, EHT for, for doing all the work that you're doing over there and uh, trying to wake up the populace to this problem. And, um, and of course we, we, um, we don't support um, activism you know, we, we're about um, advocacy and um, just like you guys, you know, we, we're, we're trying to um, trying to influence um, through uh, influence the debate around good science. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and you guys do you do that as well. You do it, do it very well. And um, Deborah Davis, of course, has been a leading light and um, in that area. And, um, you know, I've spoken to her a few times and, uh, you know, she's um, very genuine sort of person, um, you know, like yourself, you know, you're just trying to uh, trying to get the best outcome uh, for our, um, for future populations, um, uh, right. for future generations. And uh, all right. Well, okay. Well, good. Good talking to you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. No worries. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye.